Our next conversation is going to look at what we are seeing in the headlines, and uh, this is, uh, you know, at the end of the vetting. Well, it hasn't ended. Eh? There's still two candidates who haven't been um, interviewed, who haven't faced the parliamentary committee. But this majority of them that have went until yesterday, and what came out of it, pain of defending Ruto and his ways, that is a story, and this is, you know, those who have been incorporated from ODM, and now they have to come in and say, Oparanya, for example, had said, Hustler Fund, God, it's the most useless thing anyone could ever think of. Now he's like, by the way, this Hustler Fund, I think it's actually a brilliant idea. We when just need to be carefully. <laughs> hmm? Just carefully. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is it. So that's what we're discussing, the, the vetting and how we saw the vetting happening. Cabinet nominees outline ambitious plans for their dockets. Those were what was in the papers. CS nominees haunted by ghosts of their past. Um, so, in this conversation, and then, then of course, there's the People Daily. All right? The headline in the People Daily. Read it, City. Ruto mocks the poor. Bas. Hmm. Though the president wrote to power on the backs of the hoi polloi, he has stuffed his cabinet choices with millionaires whose riches laugh at the wretched of the earth. Where? We have invited an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, who is also the editor-in-chief of the platform for law, justice, and society, and he is also a law lecturer. His name is Evan Sogada. Evans, good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Niko Salam. Karibu sana to Kenya's biggest conversation. Good to be here. Sandy sana. That's the hot seat of the situation room. It's not that we are in, in interviewing you. I mean, you haven't been nominated to be anything. <laughs> <laughs> There's no vetting taking There's place. There's no vetting yeah. taking place. It's just the hot seat. <laughs> no. Niko <laughs> Sawa, uh -huh. the warmth is felt. To very, good. very good. Yes, sir. So first assignment yes. is for you to listen to CT. Mm -hmm. He's going to give you the day's proverb. Okay. He said this, for the next couple of weeks, he'll be bringing proverbs from landlocked countries in Africa. Do you know how many landlocked countries are there in Africa? Uh, how many? Are there three or four? <laughs> three or four? Uh, name them. Name, oh, name the ones that you think of. <laughs> Uganda is... One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. uh, in West Africa, we have... Which one again? Why don't you finish East Africa first before you go to East? Uh, yeah. Ethiopia... Uganda. Mm. La think Lapset. Lapset, Lapset. Ah, kidding me, South Sudan. Sudan. Brother, you, South Sudan, yes. You didn't do very well in geography, <laughs> did you? I, that was one of my favorite subjects. Really? I think it was Aiming, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's a Kenyan thing. Mm. When you ask a question mm. in a forum like this, you think you're in an exam room. Yeah. So, so now you're going to panic mode. Things evaporate. <laughs> Things which you know. They evaporate. They just go. Whoosh, whoosh. Yeah. Anyway, they're 16. 16, 16 countries. Santi. Landlocked. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We, right, we are in the Republic of Botswana. Mm -hmm. Let me just mention one thing about it. It's a very interesting party political uh, setup, government. Eh? Mm -hmm. It has a unitary dominant party parliamentary republic. Can you, can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. With an executive president. Unitary uh, let dominant me just repeat party it so that you get parliamentary. It to they have a unitary dominant party parliamentary republic with an executive president. Sounds like it's similar to South Africa, isn't it? They've mixed it nicely. Yes. Mm. We should consider also mixing it nicely. Okay? So, that so it's a parliamentary presidency. Yes. But the president comes from the dominant party. And he's executive. And he's executive. Yes. South Africa is this one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yes. Sour. Eyes can see widely. They can cross a river in full flood. Eyes can see widely. They can cross a river in full flood. Wakili, what do you make of this? You will always be keen to wade through whatever disaster, whatever floods you face. You're basically fighting for your life. Am I right? Oh, by the who, who way, who knows, man? No, 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 no. Kenyan, you see, yeah. Yeah? people went through exams. Yeah. The beauty of the interpretation is that you can't possibly be wrong. It's yours. It is your interpretation. <laughs> ah, yeah. So, in terms of marks, yes, but full. Assigned. And we ask it because every time we ask our guests, mm. we hear of interpretations that we couldn't even have imagined. <laughs> mm. And they all speak to the same proverb. Yep. Yes. Yep. It's mm. perspectives. Mm. So, Akili, we've seen the vetting. Yes. From Thursday into Friday, Saturday, and yesterday. 
um, various nominees mm. went before the parliamentary committee. Yes. Okay. Mm. And they were being vetted for their suitability to join the cabinet, mm -hmm. having been nominated by the president. Yes. Let's begin from the legal standpoint. Yes. Why is this vetting important according to the law? Well, the constitution requires that uh, those who occupy public office be as clean or near clean as Caesar's wife. I know City will be excited by that. <laughs> <laughs> so that Usuena uh, Dosari, you are somebody who is of integrity. Uh, integrity means that you will do the correct thing even when nobody is watching. Mm -hmm. So that is why we go through the ritual of vetting. We try to get the best in terms of our citizens mm. to occupy public office. So this is the principle? That is the principle, and it has a long history. If mm. you go to the Romans, uh, the Greeks, um, the English constitutional system, we have antecedents mm. where those who go to the office, public office, are the best. The animal kingdom, the leader of the pack, mm. is usually designed to be the strongest, the wisest. That is the essence, the thinking around vetting. Mm -hmm. Yes. So why vetting then? Because you could argue that the appointing authority is required to look for the best, the ones with the highest levels of integrity, to appoint. Why does, and you'd assume that when the president, for example, nominates, they have already looked at all those. Why does he have to go to parliament? Because it's the same thing when we have um, the chief justice goes through an interview panel. That panel is expected to look for all aspects of uh, the best integrity, competence and all. Mm. Goes to the president, it goes to parliament, and the chief justice is then subjected through the same. Why is the parliamentary vetting important? Parliamentary vetting is important for the reason that uh, our system of government is presidential. We have a presidential system. The president is supposed to get a seal of approval from the people in terms of, yes, this is the best in terms of cabinet secretary. Mm. So since we cannot all go to parliament and say, yes, Rais Huyu ni Mzuri, we will, in terms of theory, we will rely on our representatives in parliament. My MP for uh, Embakasi East, mm. Babo Owino, will speak on my behalf and say, who are you? Yuko Sawa. Mm. We endorse this candidate because he is the best for the position. That is the essence, that's the theory, that at least is the desire when we go through vetting. Mm. Yes. And because Parliament will have to subject this process through public participation, yes. it means that the people are the ones who are directly vetting the nominee. The people have, through public participation, and I'm glad we are having this conversation when we have the decision, Finance Act 2023, just out which emphasized what public participation is public participation is a separate power track and it was intended to narrow the gap whereby we used to elect leaders they go to parliament they do what they want i have said this publicly and even in court mm. that these fellas do not necessarily re represent us all the time so to bridge that deficit it's a conceptual deficit with democracy. That's why we have public participation as a power track that is inherent in the people. The people give their views. So you, the decision maker, you parliamentarians, when Eric Latif, CT, myself, give you opinions, at least consider those opinions and say, I will consider cities to Ogada's because city makes more sense in this manner. Ogada, you do not make sense because of reasons A, B, C, D. 
you are giving meaning to public participation. And this also has historical antecedents. Mm. We have uh, what we call the BOL, B-O-U-L-E. It used to be a small platform within the Greek democratic setting where people will come and see Tuonge, the tafakari of about what has been said and decision is made from that small pool. Mm. That is the condition that public participation intends to correct, whereby the citizen is not far removed from the de democratic decision-making process. Mm. Yes. What we've seen in Parliament in the last four days, mm. does it encompass all that? Well, we, I, I saw my senior, uh, the Speaker of National Assembly, uh, Senator Wetangula, read some material ostensibly from the public. I have a problem with that uh, approach in the sense that we do not know how many people sent items regarding particular nominees, and we do not know if these nominees addressed specific uh, questions that were presented. So from a public participation point of view, mm. Speaker Wetangula is not being accountable to us. Mm. Bring all those questions, say for this particular nominee, we got 10 questions. We are going to present those 10 questions to him. You are either going to respond to them in written format or you'll respond to them orally. We will make our consideration based on your responses. Do we know whether this happened? I don't because know. Because at the beginning of the exercise, the speaker came and said, we received several memoranda from the public, 1,300 or plus. Mm. And then upon scrutiny, the speaker, the office of the clerk of the National Assembly that was receiving them, determined that some of them were, uh, did not meet the threshold of what was expected to be brought here. Mm. Some were sending applications and saying, Ogada does not fit. Here is my CV. Replace him with me instead. <laughs> you know, that's what he said. Some of them were applications. Others were matters that they considered were not addressing the question at, on the table. And then there were others that, that were, you know, that passed. Mm. But then thereafter, how those that were considered to have passed were processed mm. is what is not clear. That's what I'm asking. Do we know... Um, whether by watching uh, the, the interviewing, whether any of them came and were told there were adverse questions or there were questions um, raised of you, there were adverse mentions raised of you mm. here, and we need you to respond. Do we know? We do not know. And the English term opacity comes in. You're working in. Um, circumstances that you are the decision maker you are the one who can determine what comes in what does not come in we are not as a public privy to some of that material because as a question of accountability and accountability is a constitutional principle you need to tell the public that for candidate Ogada we had 30 questionnaires host the on a website you can obliterate one or two three issues but host them on our website so that we look at what is there we have questions on your integrity we have questions on uh, your 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 earnings when you operate that way the public is able to follow but when you tell me that oh we determine that this does not make meet the threshold Number one, what is the threshold? Because for you to determine that something does not meet the threshold, you are required to give us the parameters of the threshold. Mm. So what is that threshold? Is it for you to determine the threshold and then continue to determine whether it meets or not? Mm. It's a problem. You know, the discussion around public participation, the discussion about representation, mm -hmm. get to the heart of this matter. Yes. And... Perhaps it becomes clearer because of the protests that began on the 25th, mm. June, and where we are right now. Because for the first time, the one subject that has eluded discussion 
accountability yes. is down on the table. Yes. And it is at center yes. of everything. Yes. Because when you say there are people we have elected, then we are hesitant to say the representatives because we've elected them. Yes. But the representative aspect of the election is not very visible. Mm. Then comes this issue of those who are nominated. Mm. Now, what I find, well, let me call it interesting. I was, I was about to use the word disturbing, but what I find interesting is this. Did it need the younger members of our community, of our society, to point out the obvious to us? It was not needed because accountability, public participation, you go back to even our traditional African communities. There's a late professor from Ghana, George B.I.T., who did a fantastic job in writing about the concept of this tooling. City, you are the chief of Clan X. You were supposed to be the custodian of this community's interests. Mm. The moment you stopped having a conversation with your people and accounting to them, this is what how the number of bags of grains we have in the granary. This is the number of spears and shields we have for our defense. And you do things wewe kiviako. You hoard everything wewe kiviako. You go against the oath of office and expectations of this community. They will distool you. These things that politicians like sitting on African mm. stools, mm. that is the stool process, the mm. enthroning process. It's a symbol of power and authority. Power and authority. Yes. So the moment you go against the requirements of that community, they are can Ghana, West Africa have a more elaborate process. Yes. You were literally taken out of the stool mm. and told you cannot sit. And that is what we have with the democratic modern democratic process as well. That if you cannot meet the standards and expectations of the citizen, then you are not fit to occupy office. Mm. And that is why we need to know. Which makes which brings in the question. Mm -hmm. Part two of my question. Yes, sir. The, do we have an understanding of what the requirements for vetting should be? Because they go before parliament, people ask questions. Is there a standard? Are we or are the, our representatives, are they mandated to have a certain understanding of what they must probe? Because, okay, financials all over the papers. Mm. Everybody's rich. We've yeah. got that one. Yes. We've understood perfectly. Yes. And the people daily uh, did a good thing in saying Ruto mocks the poor. There, they, they, they understood that one. Mm. Okay, then there is the issue of character. Yes. There is the issue of what sort of person is this that we're dealing with, a little of his history. Yes. And that's where the memorandum that was sent in come in. Yes. Because these, we believe, are from people who have bothered to figure and to look at the, 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 the history of these individuals. And they're saying, look, this person should not get this job. And the reason is because of this, 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 yes. this. Now, there may be other issues that one needs to look at. Mm. Then you want to tell us, we are benchmarking and we are basing this criteria on this. Yes. So that when you begin asking, mm. we can actually see whether the threshold has been met or not. Yes. Does such a thing exist? We have templates that guide, and we start with the Constitution, Chapter 6 particularly Article 73 and 75 of the Constitution. Mm. They give broad general parameters. Mm. Then we have the Leadership and Integrity Act, mm. uh, distilling what requirements uh, will be expected of any occupant of public office. Mm. The law, the tradition, uh, the law, has been there mm. uh, the constitution has been there the tradition of enforcing the constitution and living to this the ideal stioshida because you, you see like chapter six it makes a, a clear enumeration of the fact that the office is above the person yeah so that if you have anything like one nominee is facing questions from EACC mm. about his tenure in a, a past office. Ideally, that candidate should not have been even considered for nomination. Clear your criminal uh, 
uh, suspicions kwanza then you come to the table when you're clean but here you see i could see even the interviewers helping him to answer these questions mm. those one who was overzealous enough to give a very warped legal uh, appreciation mm. of, of things mm. there's a candidate there who has some hotel worth billions of shillings and could not explain how he came about uh, building this hotel so these are questions of integrity and you need to explain them for example eric it is not enough for you to tell me that in the last two years my uh, wealth portfolio has increased by 150 million you're earning a salary as a cs for how much do you earn is it slightly close to a million shillings yep. assuming that you earned your salary tax deductions nani, nani, you could not possibly make that amount of money so where did you get this rest of the money as a question of accountability you need to explain yes properly not just explain you're supposed to explain and provide evidence because Account, explaining yes. is easy i did this i sold maize yes. then i actually bought strawberries that, 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 that one is easy yes. so this should come from like you know sort of an accountant yes right? yes that shows that this is how yes this wealth yes has actually yes and the auditor general as well this is to an confirm. independent office all right to confirm some of these things yes. let's take a break as we go to the break i want you to mull this question yes um in a proper interviewing panel mm -hmm. when the public service commission is interviewing principal secretaries yes each panelist on the interview in the interview panel mm. has a form mm. they all have a uniform form yes where they are ranking and rating candidates yes same with the judicial service commission mm -hmm. With this one in Parliament, is there any uniform form okay. that I that they say? So, on this particular one, I score this candidate eight, and then the others score five or so, or is it just up in the air? Ah, we will meet me at sana. We wacha, we wacha ingie. It's time for that break. Twenty-eight minutes to nine. Our guest this morning is Advocate uh, Evans Ogada. He's a law lecturer. Editor in chief of the platform for law, justice, and society, the eyes and the nays of the cabinet nominees vetting. Also, would like to see from your comments what did you make of that entire exercise? Conversation continues with Wakili Evans Ogada, um, law lecturer, editor in chief, the platform for law, justice, and society. We are talking about the nominee. Uh, nominees for cabinet secretary and the vetting that was taking place in parliament so actually before we went to the break i asked you this question so do we have a uniform um methodology mm -hmm. that these committee members are using to say on this matter i score in terms of understanding of the docket i score them this in terms of their questions on their integrity and personal integrity i score this in terms of um, you know past performance in dockets or in other public service as well is there anything like that i didn't get the impression that that was present uh, with the parliamentary vetting process at least for this committee mm. uh, for the reason that if there was any scoring that was being done we could see people writing i didn't see anyone writing mm. and then you could tell that one like one particular member he was milking one question too much <laughs> you, you can't what question repeat this? you have a you have a repertoire of questions to go through mm. so when you repeat one on cooperatives and you narrow down on one particular aspect it shows that this is perhaps the only thing you prepared for and uh, yeah does this i put it to you mm. uh, more or less like a comment instead of a question so it tells you that we were just running through the motions. And uh, to also uh, lend, lend credence to this lack of uniform criteria, this question that was posed to the nominee, mm. Ministry of Labor, mm. and this one uh, riled me up a little bit. This is Dr. Matua. Yes. Mm. So when he says that he will send lawyers to the Gulf, mm. and that these Kenyan lawyers, city, mm. are supposed to help with the skewed laws that are harming kenyans here mm. nobody picked him out on that because you see these labor agreements are bilateral mm. 
Kenya, Saudi Arabia, whatever countries, you enter into a bilateral agreement on migrant workers. Right. Absent of that, we have international labor organization agreements and treaties. Mm. Those are what we rely on. So Alfred Mutua has no capacity to look at any treaties entered into between Kenya and any other state and certainly any law treaties. Why not? He's not the minister for CS4 uh, Foreign Affairs. That is where treaties, the Department of Treaties is but, located. But a labor agreement is actually signed by the labor ministry. Like the one that Kenya and Saudi Arabia signed, wasn't it the Ministry of Labor in Kenya and the Ministry of in charge of those matters in Saudi Arabia, with you the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You sign it, but the technical legal capacity is provided from the Office of the Attorney General and certainly from Foreign Affairs. Mm. So for you to say, I'm sending lawyers, you need to consult who? The Attorney General. Mm. The Attorney General will identify if there are any gaps. Mm. we we'll look at the treaty. Is what Alfred Mutua proposing, is it possible? Can we re-look at this treaty? Mm. Is it Able to, are we able to open up this treaty mm. so that we don't venture into the arena of populism? Mm. You just open your mouth for the show, eh? I will look at the treaties. That's not a campaign rally. Mm. This is a solemn occasion whereby you are counting to the people of Kenya, please respect our intelligence. And this is why the young men and women went to the street, because you are insulting our brains by giving us populist answers. Mm. You just want to tick the boxes. Because mm. if we had questions that were written down and we had people who were focused on the task, these questions should have been answered. Mm. Uh, the cooperative's man, I had him answer and his appreciation this of... This is quickly for Paranya. Yes. His appreciation of cooperatives. Cooperatives and um, labor law, these are twins in terms of their philosophical appreciation. Mm. These are socialist in nature. Mm. They are expected to ameliorate the conditions of the person. And you'll trace the origin of cooperatives and labor laws to circa 1945, mm. after the World War II, mm. whereby we are trying to improve the conditions. Cooperatives were like our chamas. Eh? Mm. People come and meet, and we try to help our lot. So when you talk of this thing called Hustler Fund, mm. which has no structure and has been a disaster, and it's intended to operate like a bank, a capitalist structure, uh, structural model, mm. does it give you the impression of somebody who understands what cooperatives were meant to do? When you talk of workers being exploited and challenges being there for the workers. Mm. What are these specific challenges? Is it labor? Yeah. Is it work condition? Mm. What are the challenges with those treaties? You need somebody with this in mind, because I was telling somebody yesterday uh, with a flippant uh, response that came from uh, Dr. Mutua. Mm. If he goes and meets uh, these labor ministers who are socialist in mind or lawyers, bred lawyers, he will be flawed, seriously. It will be an embarrassment to the Republic. <laughs> because you, you, you find somebody like Lula de Silva. This is somebody who's been in the trenches in terms of the labor movement all over the world. Mm. He's the president of Brazil. So you're going to have a conversation with Lula de Silva on labor matters. And then you go through out things like... I'll bring lawyers. Come on, you, you, you look stupid. And that's why we insist on having the right person the right job people mm. who think and think on behalf of the republic think long, long term people who can make um, uh, sensible decisions then you've actually taken us to now the fundamentals how then do we choose our legislators because clearly the representation is one thing now everything that you've said begs the question do our legislators actually understand this Legislators and the parliament currently under uh, Moses Masika Petangula has been a disappointment. I have seen people open their mouths in that house. A good number are disappointing. So we as citizens need to ask ourselves on the ground, 
are we making the right decision? Or do we need to take only the 500, the 200, and elect people, people with horrible grades? Uh, my but, but is it grades? Remember, you mentioned very clearly yes. that our constitution provides us with a marking scheme. Yes. Okay? Yes. Now, this marking scheme, yes. if you want to have examiners, because the vetting committees are examiners. Yes. So, really, should they not, should we then not make sure that these examiners are actually the people who are qualified to examine these people? Actually, there are supposed to be layers of examination and which we have failed. We have something that we have never considered and taken seriously in this country called constitutional conventions. Constitutional conventions, Eric, these are habits that uh, ingrain integrity. Mm. So, for example, in the UK city, uh, we had uh, this minister who came in late for prime minister questions time mm. by about five minutes. He said, I have come in late. I feel bad. I've let the prime minister down. I've let the government down. I'm resigning. He resigned on the floor. Uh, in other countries, <laughs> I have been accused of having a girlfriend. Just the mere mention of me having a girlfriend. Mm. Ah, I'm a Jitoa. Constitutional conventions are just manners of good habit. Mm. I cannot offer myself for leadership because of one, two frailties. What happens here? Somebody's a crook stole from a parastatal somewhere, amassed a lot of money, gets that money, goes and buys his way to elected office. Yeah. IEBC, we should be using Chapter 6 as filters to strike out of this, some of these candidates. What does IEBC do? Passes them. We go to court, and the judiciary let us down on this one. We have this Institute for Public Policy case. Uh, the Huru Ruto case. We also have Momo Matemu Court of Appeal. The import of these two cases was that until somebody goes through the rigors of a full case trial and is a judge to be guilty, that person is free to run for office. And that's why we have all these jokers. People who city cannot even head cattle dips in certain serious countries. Mm. My good friend Piolo Lumumba says that some of these people, you are a, a glorified thief. You will not be sanitized if you get into office. That's why we have people who can't even think, can't express themselves being sanitized through these flawed, skewed processes. So then what does a situation then currently hold on matters of integrity? Because you're saying that one of the things that we'll be looking for one of the principles of good governance mm -hmm. is on personal integrity. Yes. That's in the Constitution. Yes. What does it mean? And what should you have been seeing with all these nominees? A matter of personal integrity. What question would, should they be asked to bring out their personal integrity? We need to see questions that call for reflection. And uh, for me, the president lost it with this moment. This for me was a constitutional moment. If I were him, I wouldn't have returned those who served with me in the last cabinet. Somebody like Professor Skindiki who served in internal security. People were killed. We saw this young man who was shot and his brain splattered under your watch as CS, as a question of integrity, personal integrity. I cannot come back to the same docket in good conscience, leading the same office after having sanitized what the police did. That's a question of personal integrity. Hmm. I cannot in good conscience lead. I fail for one or two reasons. So it's a matter of conscience. It's a question of conscience, but... And personal bar, or is there is there a uniform bar by which you now we say this is our bar as a society? Because Kithura Kiniku was asked these questions mm. about what happened, the protests, mm. this current protest, last year's Sufuria protests. Mm. And he said, I am not the Inspector General of Police. There's a National Police Service Commission, and there's an Inspector General of Police, and there's an entire command structure. I provide policy. <laughs> Which says, my conscience is clear. So according to him, in good conscience, He's fit to continue serving in that docket. So does, does, that, does that sound like kicking the can down the road? I mean, yes. if if that then was the case, mm. 
are we then saying that even if it's an independent office, that they are not situated in any ministry, mm. they are not situated in any docket within the government, that they are so standalone that they are devoid of any oversight? Is that, is that, is that what he was saying? Mm -hmm. Because that's what his office is supposed to do. He is the minister. We, we've had ministers out there resign for just making false statements. Yes. He is on record as having sanitized the killings on the street. Mm. So I think that is a far stretch from the CS. Nominee. So that's what I ask then. Against whose bar? Mm. Because Professor Kithura Kindiki came and said, I, in good conscience, believe that I can still serve in this docket. All right? Mm -hmm. So if the vetting committee comes and says, we, in our collective good conscience, believe mm -hmm. that Kithura Kindiki should continue serving, mm -hmm. can anybody question? I mean, who, what's the bar here? We failed. The bar is there in the Constitution, Article 73, as read with 75. We have failed to nurture, because Chapter 6 should have been the moral part of the Constitution the moral ethical part and how you enforce that you just don't enforce it through the court system mm -hmm. it is enforced through practices and traditions so for example at cabinet level the mere whiff of uh, problems with a certain candidate we agree as a cabinet when you're mentioned in terms of these uh, problems the siren issues here on the road mm -hmm. bullying us on the road cabinet secretary that's be and becoming you go out step mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. and indeed Willy Mutunga started us off well and people didn't understand what Willy Mutunga did when uh, the then Chief Justice was accused of pinching somebody's deputy. nose that was deputy, uh, deputy Chief Justice mm -hmm. that was a quote-unquote minor thing but what Willy Mutunga did was he put pressure on his then deputy and said madam you'll have to go so that we maintain the integrity of the office the pinching of the nose was not as egregious as some of these things. Mm. But what Mutunga was trying to present to us was the possibility of people seeing that the office is above you, the person. He was introducing that culture. That culture. But you see, for a constitutional convention, since they are dependent on sustenance and long practice, we have not done well in that aspect. Because at some point, we had the kimunyas of this world who came and told us, I'd rather die than resign. resign. Still alive, though. Still alive, though. Mm. Mm. Uh, we have people here he who are removed from office. Yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> we have people here who are accused of all manner of scandals. And then they will come and tell you, the, the legalese, oh, uh, we'll have to wait for the court process, due process, mm. as you hear them say. Mm. Chapter 6 was to have been maintained by a political culture. Okay, so, in your opinion, Wakili, yes. let's talk about, for example, Wakili for Paranya. Yes. There's a civil case ongoing in court yes. about him, and it is, there's, there's a court order in place mm -hmm. that has frozen part of his accounts as this civil case continues. Mm -hmm. And the civil case has been instituted by the ESCC mm -hmm. because they're saying that we believe that he has some wealth that was not properly acquired acquired mm. and that's why there's a civil case mm. and a court order saying freeze the accounts mm. there's an ongoing live case mm. there's the other on the back and forth about the criminal case mm. of um, receiving money through corrupt means mm -hmm. uh, i don't know whether that's a, the proper terminology or whatever yes but where the dpp had initially approved if, uh, made a decision to charge mm -hmm. and now the dpp again uh, late last month rescinded that decision to charge yes. but there's, there's been this question mm. so in this kind of high bar and culture mm. for high levels of integrity mm -hmm. should we clear for paranya have been on this panel certainly not you stay out clear your name and then come and offer yourself for leadership because you see he will be going into office with these haze of suspicion around him and the the, the other danger that uh, pertains with that kind of entry an entry that is uh, this problematic we we have history we are all kenyans we know they go in there 
and then they use uh, the political office for leverage to frustrate all manner of uh, legal attempts mm -hmm. to deal with them. That's why you see every other day cases being withdrawn, witnesses uh, not coming forth, all manner of things. Mm -hmm. The very essence for you to stay out is for us to have equal levers. The process continues in the normal manner. You're cleared and you say, ah, I am clean. I have nothing against me. The court adjudged that I'm innocent. But when you go in, in this kind of cloud, and with the potential that you're going to uh, karabati vitu Man nyuma, manipulate, uh -uh. <laughs> it's not right. There's always the lingering question of, it's a quest that we keep pursuing. Yes. With every generation, we keep pursuing it. Mm. And from what I see, mm. those who are hell-bent on ensuring that this accountability discussion and anything that has to do with the rule of law, it appears that those who just want to speak of it and not follow it seem to be continuously winning the day. Because with every government, we saw with the Uhuru government, yes. things that you, you look at and it goes beyond your imagination. Yes. This government comes in, they take it a notch higher. Yes. Okay? Yes. And so you wonder, really? It's deliberate. It's deliberate. If, uh, in terms of constitutional law and history, uh, city, there is a, a constitution called the Vima Constitution of the 1930s Germany. Very good constitution, Bill of Rights, with all these beautiful ideas and aspirations. Mm. That constitution was frustrated by vested interests and politics because our vested interests in this country are uh, big money business. Mm. people who made money while in government mm. and they are acolytes so those are the ones who frustrate it the vima constitution good constitution but they create parallel structures to it so that you have a constitution me and eric will spend time talking about 73 75 bill of rights but they create circumstances and context to shadow the constitution and to undermine it that undermine of the constitution that aspect of undermining the constitution the vima constitution led to adolf hitler and the third reich so that phenomenon has been studied in constitutional law whereby unless you keep vigilance you keep uh, having these people putting their feet over the fire and holding them to account they will undermine the constitution that you will no longer recognize it You'll have a very beautiful constitution on paper, but in terms of its implementation and even in court, you'll have nothing to enforce. Mm. So it's deliberate. So as you conclude yes. in 40 seconds, yes. Okili, what would you tell Kenyans? So we expect that um, this committee will present its report to Parliament probably tomorrow. Yes. What should we expect from citizens, not from the committee anymore? From the citizens look at what will be presented if you're not satisfied exercise your constitutional rights go to court speak out do whatever you can do as a citizen within the boundaries of the law um, let us not lose hope uh, this is our country this is our generation if things go on this way we will have no country to live in life will become unbearable we only have one country, so let's keep at it. Thank you very much, Wakili. So keep it here. Let's see how the uh, committee will report back to the House probably tomorrow, and then let's see also the vetting that happens. Wakili Evans Ogada is a law lecturer, editor-in-chief of the Platform for Law, Justice, and Society. It's 9 a.m. News time.